structure is the, the uh, sequence of amino acids, or if you'd rather residues of aminos, along the backbone in order. Along the backbone. I have to be a word in this 20 letter alphabet. Uh, uh, biophysicists speak of solving the protein by giving its uh, so called tertiary structure. And this is all the way. This is the actual uh, spatial locations of all the constituent atoms in one of these proteins. By the way, I should have, uh, maybe you should have asked or I should have said, how long is a protein in practice? And this ranges from, believe it or not, length three, uh, length, num number of residues three, uh, from length three, now I have to remember, to. It's on the door. Oh, good. <laughs> to about 30,000. No, but there's an amusing thing. Length 30,000. Uh, this is for uh, it's about, uh, glutathione, which is actually a nutritional supplement I take. <laughs> but sorry, N-acetylcysteine, which is a nutritional supplement I take. To this is something called titan, which is the longest of the of the proteins. And interestingly, you know, there's a there's an algorithm for producing the chemical name of a substance from, sorry, the, the name in English of a substance from its chemical you know, composition. So if you apply that algorithm, I'm not sure you know this, Jordan, it's, it's amusing, to Titan, you get the longest word, it's not only the longest protein, but it's the longest word in the English language. Of some, I forget, it's like 189,000, I forget the other digits, you know, blah, 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 uh, letters. <laughs> so it's the longest protein, and it's the longest protein. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the, those are sort of the relative sizes of of these guys. Uh, so the tertiary structure is, like I said, the uh, spatial locations. The spatial locations of the constituent atoms, all of them. So it's a huge amount of data, for example, to Titan or something, constituent atoms. But by the way, a, a, a good sort of practical length for a protein is maybe 100 or 150 residues. There's already a wide zoo of interesting ones there, which is already, from the point of view of configuration space, enormous. All right. Um, notice I sort of left out. I get, I'm going to lie here a little bit, and in the interest of time, just say that secondary <coughs> is the pattern of H bonding. I'm lying, but only a little, and I'll hopefully be able to come clean a little bit later in the lecture. Pattern of H bonding along the backbone. So in practice, actually, one from the primary structure can compute the tertiary structure and then there are algorithms to determine what one means by the hydrogen binding based on the proximity of the atoms in the tertiary structure. You should think of this, I suppose, as at least in theory derived data from three. Although there are experimental techniques to determine two more directly than the full tertiary structure. Makes sense. Is this is this true residues participate in age one Sorry, residues. They can. They can. It's not a predominant feature of this. It's not a predominant feature. Roughly 70%, something like that, of the H's and O's participate in H bonding along the backbone. So there's not a lot more room, even. There's some room. And indeed, that does happen. Both residue, residue, and residue backbone hydrogen binding. But it's not a major. But there are sulfur bridges. So there are disulfide bridges. One of them. Uh, two of the residues contain sulfur atoms, and one of them, cysteine, there are, there are actual chemical bonds that form, the disulfide bridges, and those lead to, anyway, they're sort of a special case, I guess I would say. This business is, every, sort of, everything's a special case. There's no, there's no theorems here, so we're, we're learning, which is, makes a model problematic, but I'm coming to the model that seems to do some, some justice to this, to this zoo. Let me just quickly, so, so let me just quickly explain. Uh, the human knowledge of primary structures is, is in a uh, Swiss data bank called SwissProf. And there are about 6 million entries in this data bank um, across all species and across various experiments. And there's lots of duplication and lots of errors. This is sort of not quite the least trusted. There's a subset called Uniprof which is rather than computer human maintained and is much cleaner data, never mind. Uh, the tertiary structure is included in something called the PDB, the Protein Data Bank. And this has, as of last week or something, about 60,000 
uh, entries, and this is this massive database, clearly 60,000 times, 150 times the 10 or 12 atomic locations, whatever, per residue, and this is <coughs> enormous database. As you and I have learned, fraught with errors and problems and diseases and so on, you would think something this important would be remediated to something uh, clean and beautiful, and they've tried. But the data goes back to the 70s even, so uh, it's hard to sort of clean everything up. All right. I'd better move on. Do I pause for any more questions? Now I'm gonna, that's the discussion of proteins. I wanted to put sort of things into perspective. Here's the discrete model. So we move on now to the combinatorial model. And it's going to look, at first blush, kind of stupid and boring. See, there's some more going on here. So the discrete model, it's a combinatorial model, <coughs> is very simple and sort of probably very natural to most of us in the room. Because it's just there's an obvious fat graph sort of staring you in the eyes. I think, namely, we have this peptide unit C N C alpha C alpha O O H, like that. And to that, I'm going to associate this little. Fat, you know, I can say easily to you, fat graph building block. So there's this obvious little piece of a graph to associate. Where in effect, that's a C, that's an N. The C alphas are kind of in between. And hanging off the C is its O, and hanging off the N is its H. So, sort of brutally simple. Now, when we have one of these proteins, one of these linear polymers, you imagine a bunch of these concatenated, and simply <coughs> first blush, concatenate them in the most boring possible way. We have the first peptide unit, and we just glue it on to the second peptide unit, which we glue on to the third peptide unit, peptide, you know, on another 20, whatever it is, thousand times. We put a little dot here or something just to, well, I mean, let me put nothing. Let me just observe that there are these edges that correspond to the C alphas in this model. So it goes, you know, C and C alpha, C and C alpha. Um, all right, so it's not quite this boring. Namely, let me observe that if so, now we're going to finally get to some geometry. How are we going to capture the geometry of these peptide units and so on? It's sort of obvious as soon as I say it that we should somehow use SO3. We should somehow be talking about SO3 graph connections on something or other. Because after all, we're in three spins. So associate, so there's the punchline, here's the mechanics of that. Associated with a peptide unit is in the following canonical way uh, a positively oriented orthonormal three frame. Namely, look at the displacement vector from C to N along the backbone and take the unit vector in that direction. Now we got a vector in an oriented plane, so we have an oriented, uh, uh, so we have an or a positively oriented orthonormal three frame. Or more brutally, and as, and as we do on the computer, take also the displacement vector from C alpha to C and uh, take it in this plane, and it's, it's in the peptide unit, so it's in this plane, take its orthogonal projection and take the unit vector, and then so we've got a U and a V, and then take the cross product, U cross V. So associated with each peptide unit is a positively oriented orthonormal three frame in the way I just described. And now I'm going to go back and I'm going to modify this construction in the following kind of keen way. I mean, sort of as you can to a fat graph or sort of a very natural thing to do. Namely, I got, an, I got a, a, a three frame here, and I've got a three frame here. I've got, I've got a three frame here, and I've got a three frame here. And of course, given two positively oriented three <coughs> frames, there's a unique element of SO3 carrying the one to the other. Okay, fine, there's an element of SO3. Uh, there's a kind of a competing element of SO3 where I keep this one fixed and turn this one over, rotate by 180 degrees about the peptide bond in this peptide here to get the first three frame and now another one, and hence a, a, a second element of SO3. So now i got two elements of SO3. And let's do this. Uh, let's figure out which one is closer to the identity in the unique bi-invariant metric on SO3. And if the first one is closer, then I just draw this edge. And if the second one is closer to, to the identity, I'm going to put an X on it. I'm just trying to say, do I, you know, is the cheapest way to get from here to here to kind of pull it over, or is it cheaper to twist to pull it over? So the very natural, what I'm doing is I'm, if you think about it, discretizing the natural SO3 graph connection. Z2 by, by Z2. I'm not thinking that this, this map to Z2 from, from SO3. 
<coughs> so do this uh, along the backbone as the geometry tells you to. You go to the PDB and calculate and blah, blah. And figure